In this age of counterfeits, Dwayne Pearson is a genuine Renaissance man, accomplished academic and scholar, author of a half dozen acclaimed volumes of poetry, successful businessman, and now he has graced us with this lovely historical novel centering on perhaps the most momentum, momentous event in the storied past of our fair city. What impresses as one, one reads Annie and the Prince of Wales is first the uniquely engaging voice of the narrator, a mixture of playfulness, gravitas, and riveting storytelling. Second is the very clear amount of prodigious historical research that went into the crafting of this book. As we learn about Annie and her cohorts, we also learn details about Portland's past that were clearly only uncovered after hours spent sifting and winnowing through dusty tomes in the back halls and basements of libraries and historical research centers. So again, please join me in welcoming and congratulating Duane, and please help support the Brown Bag series in local bookstores everywhere by taking home a signed copy of Annie and the Prince of Wales following today's reading. Thank you very much and enjoy. Thank you, Bill. I don't know how much of that was true, but uh, we'll take it. Uh, I en really enjoy uh, getting a chance to tell people about this book. You know, I've done a lot of writing over the course of my life and so forth, but uh, this one's very poignant, and uh, it's kind of strange because every once in a while I pick it up and start reading it again myself, which is really unusual. And I've also had uh, several people who read it who said it's one book that they do reread. The idea for this generated for me when I was reading a book called Edward the Caresser. It was a biography of the Prince of Wales, you know, uh, Victoria's uh, son, who uh, can, became the caresser because his mother never gave him any attention and uh, gave him anything to do, so he spent a lot of his time chasing women around, and I guess that's where the caressing came in. But anyway, and, uh, the book started out with, uh, in 1860, his parents, his mother and Prince Albert, uh, were asked to come to North America, but they much preferred going to Germany. They were very much involved in Germany, and they were all their lives. Uh, Prince Albert was from one of the Prussian states and so forth. So they, uh, they sent over Bertie, their son. And uh, he was an 18-year-old boy at the time, and sort of a diminutive character, but uh, they, they didn't have too much faith in his intellectual ability and so forth. But he came over and he did this tour and it was fascinating. They started in, um, up in Halifax in that area and then they went through North America for 90 days. And they would hit these cities and everyone he came to, they came to, they'd build these mammoth dance halls. For, you know, 5,000 people could come to these dances and so forth. And of course everyone wanted their horse-faced daughters to dance with Prince Albert and so forth. I mean, with that Prince, with that Bertie, and so, but I, it was one great story after another with that. And all of a sudden, he's nearing the end of his trip and he said he's coming to Portland, Maine, and uh, where he's going to, the British fleet will be waiting for him. I said, wow, this is good stuff. So uh, I picked up on that and uh, it's kind of, what is really amazing, it was in October of 1860, and that was a time of a confluence of so many events in American history was taking, taking place at that time. It was a little over two weeks before Lincoln's election, and the city was just rife with debates, and the, there was a lot of pro-slavery, a lot of anti-slavery debates up and down the street. Uh, there was a, it was a time of the, uh, Great rebellion against uh, alcohol, the passing uh, with uh, some of you are familiar, Neil Dow, the prohibition things that came through. And actually, five years before this happened, uh, right outside here, uh, Neil Dow had gotten the prohibition legislation passed throughout the state so nobody could have anything to drink. And I'll get back to that in a minute. But uh, he did, uh, he moved some uh, beverages into the town hall, which is where Monument Square is now. And they were stored there, and it was for medicinal purposes, as he said, but everybody had their doubts about that. So a bunch of people came up to look at it. He called out the militia, and I think uh, three people died out there in a gunfight out in Monument Square at that time. And uh, so that was going on. There was also the time of the Second Great Awakening big religious revival, the second one in America's history, where evangelicals all over the place, these big prayer meetings and, you know, big, uh, everybody's being saved and so forth. And so that was going on. So right in the midst of that, uh, 
the Prince of Wales is showing up. And uh, he had uh, really big events in uh, Boston, Philadelphia, I, mean, I should say Philadelphia, New York, and Boston. And coming up here, they had hoped he'd be here for the big ball that they're having, but uh, no, he was coming up, going through Portland, getting right on the uh, ships and leaving for England. But the, um, the book, uh, when he got here, uh, the peninsula was just about ready to sink. It was overwhelmed with people. There were senators and college presidents, just about everybody. It was also filled up with pickpockets, thieves, and every other type of person you could think of was also here to greet him and watch this happen. Oh, what I think I'll do is I'll just read you a few things here. I, it is a historical novel. History is as active as could be, but the, that gets a little boring, so I have uh, gotten some uh, characters in there, too, and a little romance, which we all like. Uh, Annie is, uh, there's two women in her figure very prominently, but Annie's a young lady who lives out in the farm somewhere out near, uh, you know, out near South Portland is in that area today. But anyway, it opens with some say the nearest thing to heaven is waking up on an October morning along the coast of Maine. Annie, Anya, and that's her real name, but they call her Annie, is doing just this. Wrapped in the warm cocoon of the feather tick on her bed, she feels the cool, crisp air through an open window, squints at the sun rising out of the east over the ocean, and she hears the ever-present melodic sound of the sea. As the want of any 17-year-old Irish girl, just for one moment, she enjoys a flash of a romantic dream, wherein someday she shares the moment with a handsome young man, at this time a fragment quite abstract. However, actuality hits her like a splash of cold ocean water. It's early morning on the farm, and this means that chores must be done. Once again, reality trumps fantasy. Aunt Ida greets her with, Good morning, Princess Annie. We thought you were going to sleep in this morning. The name Aina, old Irish in the der 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 derivation, is said to mean brilliance, wit, radiance, and some wit, and some will add beauty. Never has an appellation been more aptly bestowed. It is pronounced as Anya. Family and friends address her as Annie, or sometimes Anya. Annie, smiling, grabs a biscuit fresh from the open ocean oven and uh, responds, Ah, what absolute luxury. One day I dare say I will. Out with you now. Your uncle should be about done with the animals. Go and gather me a few nice ripe apples, if there are any. Make haste, and there might be an apple pie in your future. Uh, leaving her aunt to finish preparing breakfast, she walks the path to a small orchard intending to gather ground falls under the trees before they are feasted upon by various critters, domestic or feral, that inhabit the area. Well, we get into how the ocean was so cold and lapping, and in the distance you can see these great masts from the British fleet, which is there in Portland Harbor waiting to pick up the prince who's due in two or three days. And uh, wandering around, she sees something laying near the shore, and she goes over to investigate it, and it happens to be a human. It's a body, still alive, a human part being. And uh, she goes over and looks down, and she sees it's a young man and uh, quite perplexed by it. So she runs to get her uncle and can bring him over. And it's, uh, he determines it's probably a sailor that's escaped from the, uh, one of the ships in the harbor. And uh, he's quite handsome, and handsome, so and he, that appeals to her a bit. But anyway, they go through the process of rescuing this young man, getting him to the house, and they find out he's Irish. And, of course, they're very Irish, and everybody sort of likes this conjunction of... Uh, you know, a sailor coming off of a ship is Irish and them together. And they, uh, they integrate him into the household, fearful for the uh, Brits who may be searching for him and also from what the neighbors are going to think. But they, uh, it all turns out uh, quite well along those lines. And I go through, the story goes through the relationship there. But we come up to uh, some other people who interest here. And... Uh, One of the, uh, oh, let me see here, where am I here? We couldn't get into the militias. There's a small, there's a unit of militias in Lewiston, which we get involved in. But at that time, militias throughout Maine, there were militia companies, and Portland had several of them. And uh, they, they had been around since the uh, War of 1812. And they... Uh, trained, marched around, and did their things, and uh, a lot of people thought they were nothing but a big drinking club. But they had, uh, they had, didn't seem to have too much use. In fact, it was 
kind of thought they'd be done away with, and this is 1860, who's going to need any militia and so forth, and that's what the thoughts were. So we, uh, we meet a couple of them, and uh, they're getting ready as a small detachment of them to come down to Portland because the whole group is going to come down by train from Portland, there'll be, and from Lewiston, from several communities up there. And eventually they end up, I can think, never figure out the exact number, but they, they escort the uh, Prince through Portland. There's a, at least a thousand militia. And you can imagine them marching around up and down the streets of Portland. And I think that uh, one thing that really sticks in your mind as you sit here today with this story, so many things in this story right on this very area. You had the, you had the militia, uh, I keep hitting that. The militia uh, is going to march by. Upstairs, up above us right here, there's a, the new Portland Theater. And the, there was a play put on for the officers of the British fleet. The officers are the only one that got ashore. They didn't dare let the enlisted men come ashore because they got ashore in North America. They were pretty hard to get back on the ships. But they, uh, at this theater, they put on a play for the uh, officers of the British fleet. And four or five months later, uh, John Wilkes Booth, who the assassin of uh, Lincoln, starred up there in Hamlet in the same theater. And uh, so no matter where you turn in the story, the troops marching down here, this, and the things that go on Monument Square, the history is all here. I think about it every day when I you know, walk the streets and so forth. And one of the things that they did, they'd planned for the prince, which he wasn't going to be here for it, was a great ball. And uh, it was at the, where the current uh, city hall is, but at the time they'd built this magnificent one. And it was larger than the one presently because they had determined to get the uh, legislature down here from uh, Augusta. So it had uh, quarters for the uh, assembly, quarters for the, uh, the Senate and all that type of thing. It was, it was a mammoth thing. But they, uh, this ball, straight out of Jane Austen, it was, I have the menus, the dinners they had. I mean, just list after list of things you wouldn't even believe they could prepare in those days. They had orchestras come in, coming up from Boston and everything to play at it. And the uh, tickets to the ball was um, every uh, male had to uh, buy a ticket for himself and three females. Yeah. The reason is they had these officers of the British fleet and they wanted someone for them to dance with. So, uh, and of course, my friend Annie, she gets in, invited by a neighbor who is very much taken with her, this farmer who thinks that she's, she would be a pretty good... Uh, work her around the farm and could produce him some children and everything, just what he needed. And she was, she was not at all, uh, his name was Wilbur, she uh, had to accept, and so she went with him and his two, uh, you know, uh, not too attractive daughters. And uh, of course, it gets into Cinderella tale, and they pull up out here, horses lined up the streets, and uh, a lot of them are parked up in the Montjoy area, I shouldn't, he, uh, they're tended up there, and, but the, they come up with this wagon, which he uh, made into a wagoneer, they called it, and, and uh, they get off, and uh, everyone, who's that, who's that? And somebody says, it's, uh, the thing hasn't turned into a pumpkin yet. That's a Cinderella across there. But, but anyway, she comes in, and the, the dance, she uh, just, uh, all the local girls and everything, who is this and everything? And her mother, had, her aunt had made her uh, clothing for her and so forth, and she, uh, it was all homemade and everything, but it was quite well done. And she just uh, betwixt the whole audience, the local boys who didn't dare to get too interested in her because they had the face tomorrow, and the, uh, the officers of the British fleet. And so the evening goes on, and they have this great time. And uh, uh, it has, dinner wasn't served until just about midnight, and right after, and uh, they had dance cards and everything. And her uh, Wilbur decided they had better leave after that, and he's not had too happy anyway because. Uh, Although he's on the dance card, all these young men are around her all the time. And, uh, so anyway, they, uh, she takes off, they take off and leave. But uh, while she was there, uh, one of the officers that met her was, uh, he was uh, in one of the large families, the biggest state in England. And he was quite taken with her. And the, we get into that a bit. And even the next day, they're going to be around for a day or so. He goes out and visits her and family and brings her back. And she and her parents, they actually visit the fleet. And the uh, visitation of the fleet is quite accurate. I've taken out of journals, which I read here, what it was like to go on these ships and the relics there from, um, from uh, Lord Nelson's days and everything from the uh, lanterns and so forth. But anyway, we get there. 
the ball goes on, they have the uh, several things for the British officers, and then comes the day when the prince is approaching. Uh, he's on a train, you cannot believe it. He's going to be on this train from Boston, a two-hour trip, and the money they put into making this elaborate, beautiful train for his two-hour trip is mind-boggling. It was absolutely magnificent. And of course, all the way up, it's supposed to stop at kind of Bunkport, all these places, and uh, it stops. He'll, he'll give a quick wave. These people all dressed up. They gave up. They came from miles around to see the prince, and a lot of them would like him to get a look at their daughters and so forth. And, uh, and they just gave away. So a lot of them were highly peeved that he didn't spend more time. And, uh, but uh, it was, he was interested. He was anxious to get to Portland. The train comes across the Four River out there, and there was a 31-gun salute from up on the uh, hill up on the West End up there. And uh, you can imagine 33 cannon going off. I mean, that was and, uh, smoke going up in the air and so forth. But the train comes. They, they unload. They uh, put him in a couple of big uh, carriages and so forth. He and, his, and they forgot most of the senators, college presidents and everything. They had nowhere to go. So they run to the hotels. They get a couple of uh, big wagons and stick them in. They're like stacked in there like uh, piles of logs and everything. Uh, and the, the going through, oh, so they go up through Portland. A good picture. It's in the back. There's actually a few pictures in the back of the Prince of Wales. The picture is taken over in the... Uh, I believe Oak Street, somewhere over in that area. And uh, they marched down the Congress Street all the way up to the end there where Fort Allen is now. And it's a magnificent sight to go by Longfellow's house and so forth. He was not, he didn't come up. He, he met the prince down in Boston, but his sister was living there at the time. And they, uh, they get up there, for, he's going to embark. And, uh, the elaboration of it, they had a great arch up, a great arch up there they'd built, of, uh, which uh, there's a picture of it here and so forth. He goes down through that. The uh, main, a uh, couple of the uh, Portland militia companies, of course, they're flanking him as he goes down and so forth. He goes to get on the ships, and the ships are all out there waiting. And as, he's, uh, as they put him into the uh, one that they get to take him out there, the, uh, one of the local women who had, had a nice bouquet of fall flowers, she wanted to give him has never able to reach him, so she throws it to him and hits him in the head, knocks his hat off into the, into the water, which floats away somewhere out there. But anyway, they, uh, onto the ship they go, and he gets on, and they, uh, something that you can't even imagine today, but they were, uh, they manned the yards. The sailors, hundreds of them get up, and they go up the rigging everything, and they go up, and they hand to hand, they stand the yards up there, which is a quite a sign of dignity and, uh, you know, appreciation for everything that's going on. And there's gun salutes, bam, 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 everything's shooting off and so forth. And then they, uh, they lower the uh, mast on the ships. Now, here's the interesting thing. These great ships, the British Navy, and we always think about these men of war and everything, which they were, but most of them were being converted to uh, steam. So they had steam turbines term on them, so they could bring the mast down, the uh, funnels would go up for the you know, smoke from the ships and everything, and they go out of the ocean, out into the ocean. So it was a great day. There's probably never been a day like that in Portland, or a time like that in Portland's history, except in 1825 when uh, Lafayette attended here. They had about much the same thing at the time. And the, uh, just everything about it is sort of transfixing, and I do not even gotten into the religious stuff, the meeting they had down there of a, the man who was saving souls down there, and the uh, the alcohol thing, of course, was major, because at that time, the alcohol consumption in America was about 24 percent a person higher than it is now. These people did nothing but drink; they had nothing else to do. You know, there's no TV, there's no book, and half most of them couldn't read. So you had a very long winter up here. So you uh, imbibed, and then. Taverns would even have buckets of uh, rum there where you could just spoon it out in the buckets and so forth. And people were drunk. And then on the other hand, they had the codeine and all sorts of uh, elixirs, drinks, so forth. And you could go in any, what they call them, chemical stores at the time, but pharmacists and so forth, and buy a, a bottle of uh, pretty strong stuff. A lot, of them, a lot of them you're familiar with from your childhood and so forth. But, you know, housewives are sipping on that while they're doing their... Uh, Sweeping the floor and everything, flying about a foot above the floor, but uh, it was it was uh, it was a major problem, of course, which kneeled down as people were working on. 
But at the same time, you had a population here, including the Irish, who were very fond of their drinks and thought that that was a, you know, it was a central part of life. So they actually, they, uh, for the ball and everything, they, uh, they lifted the band for that and so forth. But the, uh, so we get into all that stuff. And then by two romances, we get into, uh, I think another thing is a major with this, the militia's coming in on these trains on loading, and they load them up and take them out. And everybody doesn't think, in a few months, they're on coming down again to get on the trains, and they're going to war. And the trains kept coming for, for the next five years in and out of Portland. They'd bring in the fresh troops, and they'd carry The wounded would come back, and if you had money to bomb whoever was killed, you, your body would come back, and they'd come into Portland regularly, and everybody would be down reading all the time, reading the casualty list and everything. But that, uh, that was the next step. But uh, at the time, nobody could dream of that. And I think there's a, several little things, too, which I won't get into, but one really amazes me. I came across a, a mention somewhere of uh, the uh, Wide Awakes. And I was thinking, what the hell is this? And this was an organization that grew up. They were so angry over Buchanan being selected as president by a bunch of uh, nobodies in uh, 1856 that they uh, got together and it, it was a Republican group. They said, never again. We're going to be wide awake. So these guys marched around town, and they were large in number. In fact, a hundred of them went down to New York to march in a parade down there. They wore these uh, garments you know, that were coated so that, because they were carrying lanterns all the time, so the stuff would drop down on them. And they, they marched around these lanterns and, you know, screaming loud, loud uh, wide awake and so forth. But another thing, uh, they'd, on the corner, somebody screamed out, wide awake, and somebody from across town would answer them and so forth. I never encountered that. I mean, that came across. I just thought that was a little fascinating side part of the story. But there's so much to it, and the, uh, the, uh, most of the people, uh, you know, a couple of people won the happy endings, and many of them didn't. The prince himself, I think with the final thing I'll say on that, is uh, his birthday came when, he's going to, when they're going over. They ran in such heavy storms that for a while they got blown backwards. They ran out of fuel and they had to go, some the ships had to revert to sail. He gets back to England and his parents are, well, he's back and they shoved him off. To, they weren't even interested in what he'd done. And actually his trip was quite spectacular. And the, the aides, all these officials came with him said he did a fantastic job. But his parents weren't too interested. And then of course, as you may be aware, Prince Albert died a few months later and uh, that devastated Victoria. Victoria, he, he was German, and they, uh, great German influence in the, uh, with the Brits at that time because of her. But when he died, she was just, she mourned for 40 years. They set out his clothes every day for him, just like he was still alive and so forth, like he's going to come back. And uh, Bertie was pretty much ignored. And when she died and after a long reign in 1901, Bertie became Edward VII. And... He turned out to be a magnificent king. Somebody thinks, some people think it's the best one ever. The Edwardian age is looked upon as one of the, the golden years of English, of, in, in England's history. And uh, he died in 1910. Now the problem was, his son and all of uh, Victoria's grandchildren married in Germany, Russia, and so forth. One of her grandchildren was the was the Tsar of Russia, another was the Kaiser of Germany, another was the head of the Austro-Hungary Empire. And they were full of hubris, very much taken to themselves, and they brought us World War I and destroyed a whole generation of young men. And uh, there's some feeling that if uh, Bertie had lived for a few more years, he might have been able to either hold some of that off. And of course, World War I leads into World War II in our present time. But anyway, there's so much to hear, but it's all in the book. And, I think you might enjoy it. Thank you. And I always like a question or two or three or four. Yes? You probably, probably should read the book, but I'll ask you anyways. Uh, that, that scene from 1860, it seems like the simplest explanation for that was that they had uh, sort of an echo from the future. Yeah, they did. That's, that's, that's one thing that impressed me. So many things are going on there. You get in the debates on the streets. And the, you get in the people handing out tracts against drinking. But the, the, the battles over, I mean, 
<clears throat> there was a very strong group in Portland at the time that were still pro-slavery. They, they, the one newspaper in town is always full, full of articles on how the slaves were really traded well in the South and so forth, and we shouldn't be worrying about it. And actually, they tried to get the, the prince down there when he's making his tour, but wisely they averted it going into the South to see how well the slaves were living. But anyway, that was going on. So many things that were happening. So it was actually sort of bubbling up. Everything was bubbling up. And I think it's an interesting thing, too. It disappeared quickly because as soon as that week was over with, Lincoln was elected, to, you know, that, that was going on, and right there from there they got into preparations for war and so forth. So this event, which probably would have been talked about and ruminated over for months, just was shoved aside. And of course the town hall burned in uh, 1866 during the Great Fire. They burned, they rebuilt it. And, uh, it's much where the present one is today, and of course the one they built there, that burned again in 1908, and the one we have today was built. But all this stuff coming, coming true at the time, it's just a, it just sort of amazes me that uh, how much focus there could be on that week with the people who are coming. Even the Brits there, they, had a, they were casting an eye on this Portland and this entire area. If they had gotten in the, if, if they'd sided with the South during their Civil War, their idea was of grabbing this area and all this for northern, you know, attaching it to Canada. They really wanted the expanse across Maine and everything for the railroads and so forth they wanted to build. Would, 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 would you please repeat the question before you answer? Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> he was asking about this being the, uh, you know, sort of confluence of what, everything that was happening in America at that time. And isn't that amazing? I think it is. Uh, well, I want a little story. Uh, somebody told me. Somebody told me that uh, when ten percent of the men of Maine died in the Civil War, yes, that Maine went into a depression. You know, a psychological depression from which it has never recovered. I don't know whether that's true or not, but Maine had the higher, highest percentage of casualties of any. Of any uh, Casualties? Yes, casualties in the, of any of the northern states. You know, we had a pretty small population, an amazing amount of Maine. So I got the numbers somewhere right on the top of my head. But there, the suffering was immense. And, then and they, they went to the front, apparently. Oh, yeah, they were at the front. And they, they get killed. Yeah, and uh, one of the characters in here, uh, of course, is with uh, Chamberlain at the Little Round Top. And, uh, you know, we're all familiar with Joshua Chamberlain's story, which has uh, made me so much exaggerated. But... Uh, that was, uh, but uh, I think there's 25 generals came out of Maine. They weren't generals when the war started, they became generals. And of course, Chamberlain stands above them all. Uh, the, my favorite thing with Chamberlain, which most people don't realize, is that he accepted the surrender of uh, Lee's army at Appomattox. He had, he had been wounded five times, twice fatally, and he lived through them all. <laughs> he, uh, but he, uh, uh, Grant, to, uh, selected him to accept the uh, surrender from the from the uh, Confederate Army, and uh, at the time it was considered a magnanimous gesture. As the rebels came, the rebel army came marching down, dejected, dragging their arms and everything. He called the Union Army, he said to present arms, and click, and it all went up. And uh, General Hampton, who was ahead of leading them down, he reared his horse up in the air and called his men to present. Uh, to uh, march arms, and uh, they brought their and they marched down in great. And at the time, people uh, thought that was a phenomenal thing that had happened. And in retrospect, you know, people weren't that. Uh, we don't get in the romance that we did about the rebel army at one time. But uh, can you speak a little more about the wide awake group you mentioned? Well, the uh, can I speak more about the wide awake group? <laughs> uh, they are. Um, Staunch Republicans, and they uh, they didn't want they wanted to make sure that the the correct people, including people who had an interest in what the government was going to be and everything, were in on the election of the president, the next candidate. And so they really politicked for uh, well, they actually they ended up with Hamlin and Lincoln, you know, as the pair, and of course Hamlin being from Maine was the vice president, but they. Uh, they marched all over, big things. They, they selected, I think, uh, 106 foot tall men from Maine that go down to lead the parade through New York City. 
with this group. And the idea was never again would they just let some Lombok be appointed president of the United States. And they had quite an impact on who was selected. They brought people's attention to it. <laughs> Somewhat. <laughs> I'm not sure everybody. <laughs> yeah, I can't. Yes, Candy. You're right. Took out a lot of You're right. And I'm not in the area, so. But do you think that town hall would have pictures of it back then? Did they I would think. Yeah. Yeah, the, all the painting, the, the, the art they had in there was fantastic. It's all in the book, the things they had in there and so forth. Yeah, no. But I, she was asking, actually, if uh, people should go around today and be able to see the things from that time, like at the town hall and so forth. You read about them, but you'd like to see them. And I don't know why more attention hasn't been paid to this. I, I, I look at this and I say, this is a phenomenal story. Everybody in Maine should know about it and shouldn't be aware of it, including the fleet. I mean, there's nothing like the British fleet being here. They were here twice before, but they blew the hell out of the place. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, the, little things like, well, it's like an, no, nobody's heard about the horse revolt in 1825 when they, they burned down all the whorehouses in town. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there was a, and that happened throughout uh, Massachusetts up to here. Yeah. But there, uh, oh, there, there's so many things that just resonate with you. And I, I know when I walk the streets, I think about a lot of these things every day. And I, you wish that more people were. Of course, the church was still there. Some of the things are still here. The mechanics hall, where the uh, the British fleet was entertained there too, with a with a, with a great singer of the time, and uh, all these things. But uh, just nobody pays much attention. I just didn't know if they made you just because they I haven't seen it. Now, there's very little. There's very little. And I, yes, you back there? Lincoln Why didn't you stay Lincoln liked them a lot. They were very, they were really very close friends. But it was purely political. They, uh, they had to pick uh, Johnson from, because uh, he's from Tennessee, and which was a uh, border state. And uh, he was an avid uh, anti-slavery person, so it was done for political reasons. And Hamlin was pushed aside, which is a shame, because he was an outstanding man. The, um, I had one other thought there I was just going to give you on the, the uh, oh, I got to tell you about Annie here. Uh, some people wonder where she came from, but uh, I'm a real Jane, I, you know, Jane Austen things and everything. There might be a little bit of her in there and a couple of friends I've known over the year, but uh, she's sort of a, I guess, an idealized character, but I like her a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and the other woman in there is a, uh, Addie, who is very, she uh, marries one of the Lewiston men, gentlemen in a hurry, and she's an outstanding person too, but uh, well, I'll let you read on that. Yes? In those days, where was the train terminal coming into? The yeah. in the Grand Trunk down there, right down, the, the, the one building, the only one building remains down there. You've seen the building down there by the, uh, right the end of India Street, and there was a great Grand, tr Grand Trunk tunnel. So that was the terminal he came into? That was the thing he terminally came into and trained. Wow. What's that? Bottom in India Street. Uh, yeah, well, that's right. And up uh, the, uh, the, uh, the dock where Victoria Wharf, where uh, Prince of Wales got on everything, was a gigantic wharf up by Fort Allen Park. It's no longer there. They had a... Uh, Where's Fort Allen? Is that where the eastern from? Yeah, right up there. It's still up there. It's, uh, but there's a... Uh, but they built this gigantic wharf there because they had this ship that was going to come. It was, it was called the Leviathan. I think it was called the Great Eastern. It was a gigantic ship which was going to come into Portland. And the railway that they were going to build across Maine would uh, pick up, uh, be just taking everything over through Canada and so forth. And uh, actually, the city of Portland invested $100,000 at the time, which is several millions of dollars a day, to build that wharf and to welcome this uh, ship and the railroad, which never happened. They got screwed. 
And yes. They, they, when did the railroads come to Portland? They, uh, starting in the late 1840s, but through the 1850s, railways just really bloomed all through Boston, all uh, through Portland. Continuing up, and a lot of people aren't aware of this, right up to the 1950s in this, in our century, we had a great rail system. So going all the way up to Eastport, and uh, I mean, you could, you could travel anywhere by rail in Maine at the time. They're gone now. It's a shame. Oh yeah, summer people used to take them. It's amazing, but. Do they ever have? I know they don't really come in ships now, but do we ever have like a train that goes through Boston and then goes back to Boston? Like, do we ever welcome people anymore? You know, like how they from if England came over with the ships? Like, what was the reason behind that? Well, it was just to pick up the prints. And oh, okay. they had a. Uh, yeah. yeah. Like right here, no, and they had the five five ships of the line were there, which is a lot, and. A, some top admirals and everything, and they were. It was that's why it made such an impressive sight. Yeah. But uh, oh, yeah, like oh yeah, we've had over the years. They've had, the, and the hood was here. The ship that was sunk, a British ship. That, Irish were coming in, but Irish immigration kept going. Irish immigration kept going for the next 40, 50 years in great numbers. And uh, this is a fact. In here, they mentioned the Italians will never come here because. People were worried about them drinking too much, but they couldn't stand the cold weather. And so, and uh, so, the immigration. Come. I also have a, I also have a Shadrach Jones in here, who was a, 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 a slave who uh, came up the, not through the Underground Railroad necessarily, but he got up to Portland, uh, and I cover his history too. From, uh, and he got a lot. The uh, British love these black. Black escaped slaves on the ships are great workers and so forth, so they they welcome them. Yes. Yes, he came through here in 1825. Lafayette, and he, and he, did he, when he came 1825, and it was a great celebration. And I look sometimes in history books and they don't even mention it. They don't mention the Prince of Wales either. These two big events that happened back then sort of skip over. Historians sort of focus on what they like and are interested in, but that visit of Lafayette. Throughout North America, you know, he's just welcomed like you cannot believe. It was a big deal. Do you think citizenship is is that a steady progress, or is does it have both points? I think it has it's up and down, but uh, Portland has sort of a fragmented history and people following it. I don't know why, and Portland hasn't grown very much. Population now is not a heck of a lot different. It was during the Civil War. I mean, it's bigger, but it was. It's like a lot of cities, Boston, I mean, they've grown hundreds of times the size they were. But Portland's remained kind of static for some reason. And uh, the history of it is kind of hard to track down a lot of these things. And I knew I was looking for it. I figured a lot of it would be in journals. Everybody back then kept journals. So I go over to the Historical Society and uh, look at these journals. And you pick up the journal, and the guy kept the journal for 80 years. Uh, September 17th, 1871. Cloudy today. Looks like rain tomorrow. <laughs> there weather. Everybody, that was the biggest thing. Everybody recorded the weather. Except there are a couple of very good journals there, which uh, one of them, the guy is, covers his visitation to the, uh, the British fleet, one above the ships. And, and they actually took people out there. He was impressed with how shaggy the soldiers and the, the, the sailors looked and everything. Well, that's, when, that's, like you say, there's no, you learn something. You do. The, the taciturn New Englander. Yeah, it's kind of. But I, we can't comprehend too what it was like to live in Maine during those days. A hard time. Well, you had really long winters, and they say they're worse, but they may have been, they may have not have been. But there was nothing to do. People, uh, some people read, but a lot of people didn't. Most people didn't. So, uh, and if somebody came to give a speech, I mean, today we'd say, oh, I hope the guy doesn't talk too long. They were ticked off he didn't guy didn't talk for two hours. They love to hear people talk no matter what the hell they're saying. And so they welcomed him. But uh, it was a different time. But uh, that getting through a main winter and living here and surviving and everything was quite arduous. And I think it's one of the things that's amazing here. When you walk around, the, uh, when you walk around this town and the brick sidewalks and a lot of these streets, somebody coming back from that time in 1860 would pretty much recognize the place. They couldn't in New York City or something like that, but they could in Portland, Maine. One more question. 
Yes. They weren't. No, I cover that in here. Uh, Annie asked why, asked her friend here, uh, why so many people are just staring at him, they're not cheering. He says, because they're Irish. And, they, and then there's a lot of people, a lot of the militia in there, men said, we should be going down here to kick his royal ass out of here again like we did 80 years ago. And uh, there was a lot of that sentiment. But conversely, people could not figure out, as we cannot today, that this sort of adoration of... Uh, monarchies and uh, kings and so forth. A lot of people find the romance in that that we still do today. Sometimes you wonder, but the, it's still there. Well, I don't think we're allowed any more questions. So uh, I thank you very much. <laughs>